So welcome again. I just wanted to share the objectives of the Farmer Idea Lab series. Uh, this series was uh, the brainstorm of Debbie Hamrick with NC Farm Bureau Federation and here in North Carolina. And this is our second in the series. Uh, it's intended to provide opportunities for farmer to farmer sharing. It's an opportunity for you to hear success stories and lessons learned from your peers. And we hope that you'll come away with new ideas to help your farm become more profitable and hopefully leave inspired to continue evaluating your farm business uh, and making sure you're adapting to changing markets and new opportunities as they arise. So briefly, uh, Jose Cisneros is the liaison for international programs in the College of Agriculture and Life Science uh, at North Carolina State University and also faculty in the Department of Horticultural Science. Cisneros' area of expertise are entrepreneurship, international horticulture, and information technology. Uh, supported with extensive experience by founding startups, participating in international agriculture development programs, and as a consultant for interna international marketing. Briefly, for those who are not familiar with this Blackboard Collaborate webinar platform, you uh, hopefully have had worked through your audio through the audio setup wizard. If not, if you're having trouble hearing, you can use that wizard uh, at this point in time to set that up. Uh, also, if you're having trouble hearing, you might check your audio volume as well. And then uh, we'll view the presentations. And then during the presentation, you are welcome to enter any questions you have into the chat box. And we will moderate uh, a Q&A response to those questions after the presentation today. So I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, which include the, the CES North Carolina Growing Together Project, uh, NC Farm Bureau Federation, NC State Horticultural Science Department, and North Carolina Cooperative Extension. Just quickly, the agenda. Jose Cisneros will introduce BMAC Baldwin. Uh, Mr. Baldwin with Baldwin Family Farms will share his presentation on the entrepreneurial opportunity of limited resources. We'll have time for your questions, and then we'll close and send out an evaluation. So Jose, if you are ready, if you could push your talk button and turn that on, and I'll hand this over to you. Thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, it is really my, my pleasure to introduce uh, B. Mac Baldwin. Um, I have to say this, uh, I have a long experience working with, uh, business, uh, with business people from all dimensions, from all sizes, small ones, big ones. And one thing that is hard to find is business people that understands, that connects the technological production side with the marketing side. Uh, and one of the few people that, uh, that I met that has it really very clear is DMAC. Uh, I have seen his operation, I have talked with him, and he had it clear. He had both sides are great operations, and, and I think is uh, uh, the key of his success. Uh, I want to delay and take more time from DMAC. Uh, please welcome Big Mac. It's your turn. Thank you, Jose. You're mighty gracious for your compliments there, and uh, I just trust that this presentation will live up to those, uh, those good words. Um, I would like to uh, start with a, a, uh, a slide which talks about my contact information. Uh, so let's get the second one, Jose, up there. Um, I, I want to direct you to my website, uh, bowlandbeak.com. We, we've tried to put a wealth of information on that website for our readers, and we've had many, many uh, consumers compliment uh, us about that, how they learn so much from the website. So uh, uh, I encourage you to do that. My, my cell is there. You're welcome to call me at any time. You see my VMAC is in quotes, and um, uh, this is a marketing uh, thing that's happened to me. Uh, my, I've been known many, many years as my clean Mike Baldwin. 
And uh, about 15 years ago, we realized we had to really get into marketing business to do the direct marketing that we envisioned for our beef. I picked up my first initial and uh, kind of read it together and just say VMAC. And I would uh, recommend if you're in the marketing uh, end of the business to do that to your name if you can. Something that makes your name unique so people can remember it and associate it with your product. Uh, that's uh, caught on, on on our beef and it's helped to uh, to brand our beef. And so uh, not only has the beef branded as uh, Bowen beef, but also the, the name. And uh, it's uh, something I recommend. Um, we uh, want to show you quickly our family. Um, <clears throat> Call ourselves Baldwin Family Farms, and uh, that's sort of a dream of Peggy and I. We just come through the campus here at NC State this morning where uh, we came uh, shortly after we were married. Uh, I was in school here, and we're living in a uh, veterans housing here on campus. And, and uh, the cattle herds were on the back side of the campus, and uh, we uh, would ride a Vespa scooter back there and talk about a, uh, a family farm we'd like to have one day. And uh, Peggy is standing behind me in that picture. My daughter's in the yellow. Uh, we we couldn't produce a family, so our family's adopted. We adopted uh, Patty uh, when she was in the first grade, and uh, the big guy on the right hand side on the front row is uh, our son Craig, and we adopted him when he was five weeks old. And so the rest of the crew that that you see are uh, the family that they gave us. So uh, we're grateful for. Uh, God's providence in giving us a family. So um, we're thankful. Um, entrepreneurial opportunities of limited resources. Now that's that's a fancy title. Um, and uh, what I would like to do is just simply get down and with some plain talk and talk about what we think that means. Uh, in plain English, I think it, this is an expression that has been in my family for many years, and I'd like to share it with you, and that is do what you can where you are with what you've got. Um, my dad uh, gave me that expression very young, uh, early in life, and it's sort of stuck with me down through the years. And uh, whenever I was confronted with something that I didn't think I could do, I just kept trying and trying to, to figure out a way and make it happen, and it finally happens. Um, this is a picture of uh, VMAC and uh, the little guy that we adopted, uh, Craig. Uh, this, this is, he's about a year and a half old there. He was five weeks old when we got Craig. And uh, this is Peggy's home farm in Burlington. Uh, her dad passed away, and, and uh, this is, he had a small 19-acre tobacco farm. And, and I started on that farm. Uh, the family let me have the farm to work. With uh, that's a B model Alice Chalmers tractor I'm sitting on. Uh, if you know much about those kind of tractors, you know it does not have a live PTO shaft, so you can't operate uh, a, a cutter with it. Uh, but I didn't know that. Uh, so I, uh, uh, and you see the light I have mounted on the back of the tractor, I was set up uh, determined I was going to be able to cut hay and make hay, and I had to do that at night because I had a day job. So I found a horse drawn mower. We put it behind the Alice Channel B model and we cut hay. So that was my beginning. And, uh, now, my background is um, we've been cattle in the cattle business for over 50 years. Um, our, our business is producing and grazing Charlotte cattle, and we direct market that now as an all natural grass fed Charlotte beef. Uh, we're very blessed to have some strong markets. We were in 11 Whole Food stores and recently in uh, North Carolina Kroger, Kroger stores. Three organic markets, the Carburetor Farmers Market, and internet uh, sales and shipping. <clears throat> By the way, the Carburetor Farmers Market is where we started. Um, I would recommend that anyone who's starting out to do direct marketing to, to start with the farmers market. There, you're facing the consumer every week, and you get immediate feedback on your product. And um, when you're starting out, you need to continue working on that product so that those customers come back and tell you uh, that's remarkable. That's a very, very good product, and we love it, and we tell our friends. Now, if they start telling you that, then you're, you, you're, you've made a home run. And what you then need to do then is do more of that 
and you keep keep maintaining that quality that uh, there that you gave them that feedback from. So um, uh, you hear me speak about God's providence quite a bit in my life. I um, I'm a believer that um, God orchestrates our days and our, our divine intersections and people as we, they cross through our life and across paths. And I joined the Gideons International in 1979. This is an association of Christian business and professional men who place the Bibles in the hotels and motels and jails and prisons and, and university campuses and that sort of thing. Um, and so I got to associate with a these great guys and to hear many, many testimonies of people who had, who had read the Bibles and how those scriptures had changed their lives. And uh, uh, in the course of uh, getting more and more deeply in scriptures, I found Psalm 37, 4, which changed my life. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And I've tried to implement that in my life and I have realized what I believe is the desires of my heart. Uh, the, the, the dream that I had very early, and that's, that's the picture you see of the dream uh, of our place. Um, the um, house up in the grove of trees there is our home house, and um, if you look carefully to the right, there, there's a building that used to be a three-car garage, and that's our meat sales uh, store. And, of course, the big barn on the right is our handling facilities and working pens for the, the cattle. Uh, these cattle are standing in uh, ryegrass, round ryegrass and crimson clover. And I'll talk to you more about that as we go along. That's a very important part of our equation. Uh, this is a real neat uh, picture of some steers. If you'll notice real carefully, uh, the steer on the uh, about third from the left, if you look real carefully, you'll see a stem of grass hanging down from his mouth. That's a stem of crabgrass. And that's one of our summer forages, uh, the, the, the primary summer forage, and we'll talk about that a little later. That's very, very important to us. I've uh, laid out what I believe are 10 points uh, to be a successful cattleman. Um, and point number one is the most important, is to claim your dream. Whatever your dream is, uh, as to uh, whether it be a cattleman or whether you want, um, whatever you want to pursue in life, you, you have to reach out and claim that dream, and the earlier you do that, the better. Um, one of my uh, heroes was uh, Stonewall Jackson, and when he was a professor at VMI, Virginia Military Institute, um, um, he would encourage the men. In fact, there's an archway uh, there now in the, in the school which has this inscription on it. A man can be what he says he can be. And that's extremely important in my thinking. Um, if you're not willing to speak up and say what you want to be, then you're not going to get anywhere. You have to really reach out and, and claim the dream that you have and and and, and speak it uh, and keep speaking it. Uh, speaking your dream is the first step to success in my book. Uh, in my case, I had a dream of very early in my life of... Uh, being a cattleman and uh, having something to do with making my living with cattle. Uh, my grandfather had a tobacco farm, as most North Carolina farms are. Uh, very, he had a couple of milk cows, but, uh, but at any rate, I would get his progressive farmers and farm journals and take them home with me and clip out the pictures and, and uh, paste up uh, uh, a, uh, a book of cattle pictures. And I pretty well had all their names <coughs> under there. I finally convinced my dad that I needed to buy. I needed a calf. Uh, I saved up sixty dollars by the time I was ten years old. My dad was an antique dealer. I was not on, raised on a farm, and uh, I heard him tell my mother, "Well, we're going to get this calf from Ag, but uh, this will be this will be it. We won't he won't want to know any more about cattle when he after he gets through taking care of this calf." So, I brought home this calf, and I began to learn how to take care of this calf. Fell in love with him. We didn't have any fence, didn't have any pasture. I put a halter on his calf and a chain and, and uh, would stake him out raising uh, yard grass. But uh, that was a wonderful uh, experience. I never did. I've never have gotten over uh, being a, a cattleman and, and being around cattle. And uh, so I tell, I tell people, what my dad didn't want to have it, didn't work. So 
I fell in love with that with Kevin at that point. Uh, and all uh, uh, corporate extension began to kick in in my life. I met uh, at that time. It was not called uh, uh, extension directors and agents. It was called county agents. And uh, a guy named uh, uh, Watts, Jack Watts, who was the, the county agent in Durham County at that time, he came to my life. He showed me how to make a steer out of my calf and how to take care of him. And we became great friends. And uh, he, he we set the farm up. I set the land up. We had about an acre and a half. And by the time I graduated from high school, I had six head of cattle there. And an acre and a half, and I had a fence and then fescue. Uh, now, how in the world do you raise six head of cattle on an acre and a half? Uh, I got a job at the um, uh, Colonial Store, and I was in a produce department. And I'd bring home the scraps of corn, uh, the lettuce, the uh, whatever, the potatoes, whatever that was, was uh, they were scrapping out, and I'd feed my cattle. So I learned to feed byproducts very early in my life, and I'm still doing it today. And I sold my herd, uh, going to Navy. It took, I took them to the stockyard, and I learned another lesson. That's the last place you want to sell cattle is the stockyard, because you're a price taker, not a price maker. And uh, so uh, you'll always be disappointed in the check. So that's the last place. Now, point number two is you have to marry the right partner. Um, um, <laughs> we, um, uh, I, I, we used to ride a little Vespa scooter around the campus. See, I might have mentioned this, and we always end up on the backside of the campus, uh, looking at the cattle herds. I was an engineering student at that time, and and uh, I would tell Peggy, you know, darling, one day we're going to have a cattle farm. We're going to have a cattle herd like this, and she said, yeah, yeah, big boy, you're going to be an engineer. I said, That's fine, whatever. <laughs> And uh, I said, listen, I'll tell you, I mean this, this is, it's just stuff, it's real stuff. So finally, uh, when we got into it, uh, uh, my second point is be prepared for some blowback sometime. The time gets tough because um, when the checkbook gets short and and uh, everything, everything's being squeezed because of the cattle. Uh, in fact, I remember Peggy telling me one time, uh, you tricked me anyway. I thought you was, I was marrying an engineer and I ended up marrying a cowboy in a suit. So uh, things can get tough, but uh, keep keep uh, keep holding on to your dream, and, and uh, eventually she'll be the queen. And I love it. That's what uh, I would my advice would be. Um, point number three. Well, that's that's the picture. I, I I put that in because I wanted to see my sweetheart uh, when we got married. She just graduated from nursing school. And I was uh, born in my senior year at NC State as a double lead, as an electrical engineer major. Point number three is seek out mentors. Uh, my first mentor, as I mentioned, was Jack Watts, a Durham County uh, uh, agent. Uh, and he stuck with me all the way through high school. I mean, uh, I love that guy. And he was, he was so good to me. He got some uh, grant money to have me put the, the grass in and put the fence in. And, uh, even more recently, uh, corporate extension, uh, Matt Poor, Dr. Matt Poor, uh, he taught us a great deal about byproducts, commodity feeds. Uh, Paul Walker was the livestock agent in Alamance County when uh, we really got cooking on Peggy's home place there, the 19 acres. Uh, and of course, Joy and I, Joy's with me today, and and uh, I love I love extension. Uh, all the, it's it's a wealth of uh, information that they have at their fingertips that whatever you need that they can help you get that information. Other cattlemen in my life, Mr. R. C. Cossey. Uh Mr. R. C. was a, a great old Horn Hereford breeder in Guilford County. And uh we got to be friends and and uh he decided he wanted to cut back on his operation. He uh, called me one day and said, I'm willing to sell you a group of my cattle and lease you to farm. Are you interested? And of course I came home and tell Peggy about that and uh, and she said, you've lost your ever-loving mind. His farm was about 25 miles from where we were at that time. But she said, uh, I said, well, I believe the Lord's in this. She said, well, whatever you think, that's all I need to hear her say, you know. And so we uh, we we bought 60 head of uh, Horn Herefords and leased his farm for five years. And, and I went to college under Mr. R.C. And uh, it, uh, it, it taught me a great deal. It taught me one thing. You do not have to be uh, constantly supervising cattle if you've got a good fence and plenty of good tight fence and plenty of water. So uh, 
we've, uh, we're still remotely managing cattle to a great extent uh, today because of what we learned from Mr. R.C. I'll tell you about Dr. Holland Rogers a little later on. Be profit general, uh, driven. No long-term success unless you're profitable. And uh, I hear cattlemen say, men say, well, I can't make any money on cattle. Well, you need to stay small enough till you do make a profit. Don't try and try to get yourself all wound up with a, bit, a big operation and uh, um, not have it, uh, the kinks work out in it. Uh, one handy way to learn is to do your own income taxes. Uh, you start looking at the F schedule. You know, it'll tell you where the, where the loss is and the profit and loss. And uh, just keep doing something that, until you do something that works and then do more of it. And that's my simple advice to that. And that's what we've done. We changed our operation a dozen times over the years. And uh, now we believe we've got the, the ideal setup for, uh, for North Carolina. Um, North Carolina is a consumer state. We've got 10 million consumers in North Carolina in a, in a great four season uh, uh, climate with uh, normally 50 inches of water. So we can, we can grow some good grass. Point number five is being an innovator. Um, we're always looking to do something new each year if we can. Uh, the, the, the current focus is on uh, looking at pet food. Uh, you realize that uh, there's a, a set of uh, market, uh, people out there, customers out there that's looking for high quality pet food. And there's nothing higher quality in pet food than, than raw organ meats. And guess what? Uh, when you process cattle, you have organ meats and you have tripe. And these are uh, very much in demand by people who are, have a, have a high end uh, uh, demands on their pet food. So we're looking at that right now, and trying to put a facility together on the farm to be able to process that and get it on the market. Uh, attacking the limiting factors, uh, reducing hay feeding is a is a big thrust for us. Um, hay is the most expensive uh, feed that you can feed cattle. Um, Obviously, we want, to, we want to graze the cattle as much as we can. Um, this extension has done a great job in trying to get the message out to the cattlemen in North Carolina about uh, the primary forage here is, is fescue and stockpiling the fescue to get that uh, winter feed down, cost down. Uh, we kind of took a different approach because we were grass feeding our cattle and, and uh, we didn't uh, fescue does not work very well for that. I, in my opinion, it puts an off flavor in, in the cattle that you're going to eat. Uh, so uh, we went a different way, and uh, I'll show you a picture uh, in the next one. Uh, this is our winter feed. Uh, this is Marshall ryegrass, and uh, it, uh, you can see we got we need more cattle in that picture. That's for sure. And so uh, we love Marshall ryegrass. It's a great winter feed. And uh, it's, it's our primary winter component. Go ahead now. And this is uh, this is on over in the uh, uh, early part of the season where we. This is probably a November picture after we put our put our rye grass in the fall, and this stockpile grass is what we will take off through the rest of the winter, and uh, and leave the leave the hay baler in the shed. Okay. <clears throat> Develop alternative feed system. Uh, this is a biggie for us. I, I, I hinted at that a little moment, a moment ago when I talked about when I was a kid and working in the uh, um, produce department, bringing home the uh, scrap produce. Um, North Carolina has um, um, a lot of available byproducts, of vegetable byproducts from canning operations and, and processing operations. And they make excellent feed if they're Handle properly and uh, put before the cattle right. And uh, these companies are out there, and we network with them to provide a green solution for that. These products would normally have to go to the landfill, but uh, we work with them and, uh, and bring them into our farm and blend together rations that we can feed our, uh, especially our mama cows, and uh, get them uh, through the winter without expensive feed of, uh, and almost as cheap as grazing. Look at the next picture if you would. Uh, this is a uh, this is a setup there. Uh, we're putting carrots in that bucket. Uh, this comes from a cannery, and you realize that carrots has this, about the same plant food as corn, and uh, it's, a, it's so we've got a mixer set up there. We've got another mixer that we we built. We took a cement mixer truck and took the tank off and put a big mix mixer box on, 
box on it. We can get it. We can feed 250 cows at one time with the blend that we put in that box. So uh, you see the houses behind it. They're poultry houses. Uh, we've got eight of those. Uh, they're there for a purpose. Uh, you know, they generate, uh, of course, uh, uh, cash flow every week. And uh, but we get uh, uh, 300 tons of marvelous plant food, organic plant food, on each one of the houses. We produce about five million pounds of, uh, of, of organic plant food out of those eight houses that we use. This is another pit of uh, this is a watermelon, camel, and pineapple. This is from a process, huge processing company here in uh, not too far from our farm, and we bring that in. We started out with them very small. Uh, when they were first starting their operation, we'd bring home one. Uh, I think we had a, 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 a time, at that time a big long tandem dump truck with a 22 foot bed on it. And uh, we'd bring that home once a week. Uh, now we're bringing home two tractor trailer loads a day. So that's part of our um, mixing. Now, uh, expand by, uh, by leveraging, we lease wherever possible, leasing operations, uh, equipment and land where possible. Uh, go ahead. We're running out of time. Okay, point number six is take calculated risk. Uh, get all the information you can and then make a decision. Some people just can't make a decision and you have to, you have to make decisions. And, uh, make sure that the debt that you, uh, uh you take on is, it generates income. Uh, and, and seek out synergism. Uh, we mentioned the poultry a while ago. That works very well with cattle. Um, we, uh, we just they, they, a chicken works once a week uh, when she, I mean, once a day when she's laying eggs, and a cow works once a year when she's producing a calf. So we we optimize those two and put them together and, and got uh, that uh, synergism out of it. Okay. Uh, be a marketer. We. Um, uh, we realize that uh, in order to, to be successful in marketing, you've got to get your name out there. And you, you better have a good product. You better be remarkable, and uh, you better have a, a, a way of connecting that product to your story. And uh, all of this, the grassroots of that, is a farmer's market. And then you start branding uh, with your uh, uh, brochures that you put out, uh, your uh, um, labels on your product. Um, Making sure always that you have a happy customer. I, um, I always say to a happy customer, you're now part of our unpaid sales staff, and I'll equip them with brochures and uh, ask them to give them to everybody in their Sunday school class and their neighbors and tell them about our beef. So that's how we sell. Uh, constantly seeking out new information. Uh, grass is our business. We sell grass. Um, uh, we just put up a sign in our meat sales room. Uh, I'm a secondhand Vegetarian. Uh, I eat uh, cows, and cows eat grass. So uh, that's what we sell. We are selling grass. We 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 seek out the grass experts to see what we can learn, uh, how we can do a better job. We're very um, been very much a part of the North Carolina Forage and Grassland Council and the American Forage and Grassland Council. And we pioneered a year for a year-round grazing, uh, nearly a year-round grazing system, a nearly year-round grazing system. It's not absolutely year-round, but it's pretty doggone close. And if you'd like to know more about that, you can go on our website and look. Uh, we have that uh, documented in a, uh, an article on the website, so you can check that out. Um, be profit uh, to be a. Uh, to be adapted to change, uh, you, you, we're constantly looking at um, how we can do things better and uh, simply follow the money. Uh, my son came to me the other day and said, Dad, we're paying way too much on uh, what it's costing us to maintain this equipment. We've got, I think, six road tractors now and dump trailers and walking floor trailers and belt trailers. And I uh, said, uh, you know, we need to we need to dig 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 and come up with thirty or forty thousand dollars to build enough farm shop. So uh, we're going to do that. We we um, we feel like that, that that's going to be able to to uh, make some changes to save some money on the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever your experience is, uh, try to leverage that to uh, to make make the next step to making changes. Um, investing in the future, we. We've constantly, Peggy and I have constantly invested everything we've ever made back in the farm. Um, 
this could very be, be the number one point that I should have made. You have to have a long range outlook. Um, um, you, you, you must have a five year look outlook, if not longer, at least five years and possibly longer. Handle is a long range outlook to begin with, uh, oper uh, operation anyway, uh, planning for that. Uh, we started very small. We, we purchased two Charlie heifers in 1969, and uh, we stayed small. We learned to artificially inseminate and had uh, uh, kept retaining heifers and kept building a breeding herd and building a breeding breeding herd and, and kept leasing farms uh, until we were confident we had a, a the right breed of cattle and we knew how to manage them to produce a profit. And that's when we bought our first farm in 1981. Uh, we've grown from there and we're expecting if, uh, if all of them are bred, which are looking doggone good, uh, we're, we're practicing checking them as we're working them too, and we got real good pregnancy this year. We're looking for 800 calves this year. So uh, that's how we've grown, by uh, investing back with uh, very Canadian efforts. There's two ways to invest. You either buy it or produce it, and we've gone down the producing road. It's, uh, it's taken uh, quite a few years to do this, over 50 years, but we the locomotive is, is uh, going downhill now and it's shady, so uh, we're glad. Okay, I believe that. One final thought. If you want to be in the top 10% of cattlemen, just don't quit. Because 9 out of 10 of your shares are going to quit. And that's my advice today. Uh, I trust that this has been helpful to you. God bless. Okay. Uh, uh Thank you, Mac. This was a great presentation. Uh, I just have one question for you that I have been thinking is, uh, as I said at the beginning, many business people, especially in agriculture, doesn't think much uh, about the marketing side. So, if, Mac, if you can get one, one advice about marketing, what would be that? The number one advice I give about marketing is really, really focus in on your product. Um, your product has got to be remarkable. Well, what does remarkable mean? That means that whomever is going to buy this product and take it home and cook it uh, has got to say, wow, this is the best I've ever eaten. Uh, this is good. And the husband tells the wife, where did you get this? And she says, well, I've got it at Baldwin Farm. So we went down to Whole Foods and bought some grass-fed beef there at Baldwin Farm. And he'll say, you got to have more. we got to have more. Uh, so you've got to keep working on that product to get it remarkable. In my case, uh, we had to change our forage system entirely. We, North Carolina is a, is, a, is, a, is a fescue state, and I am confident if you want quality grass-fed beef with the right flavor that people are going to talk about, it's got to be grown with, with annuals. And the breed of cattle in Charlay is, uh, I know of no better uh, breed of cattle to have a, the right kind of texture. We give you a 90 ground beef and uh, out of it, it'd just be a, it'd be a one for two. So uh, that's my recommendation. Keep working on it, make it remarkable. Okay. Yes, great. Joanna? Thank you so much, VMAC. Uh, yes. I really appreciated hearing about your farm and what has led to your success over time. We do have a couple of questions in the chat box, if, uh, if I could read those out to you and hear your response. The first one is from Sean, it says, VMAC, please comment on what you would like to see change with beef processing in North Carolina. Well, uh, we're fortunate in, uh, in North Carolina to have the processing capacity that we, we currently have. There are some states that don't have any uh, custom processing capacity. Um, in my case, uh, I have two custom plants that I can draw on to, uh, to uh, do my work to get our cattle processed. Um, there's, 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 if, you, if you provide the, the business, the processing plants will come, in my opinion. Uh, and with the interest that's taking place in North Carolina of uh, going back to local foods, and there's a lot of cattlemen, uh, now who are looking at doing some direct marketing themselves and want to have the, the beef processed. That's business that the processing plants need to stay in business. And um, uh, I think the town of Concord, they have to build a, a local processing plant in that area for that to serve them. Uh, we, uh, we have a, 
uh, a plant in Salish City that does our work, but with the, it's a halal plant. Uh, I'll mention that in just a moment. That's run by uh, Abdul, Abdul Shadre. Uh, and uh, halal means it's uh, beef that has uh, been uh, processed by uh, Muslims. Uh, and they say a, a Muslim prayer over that beef. And uh, so a lot of our people, a lot of our customers who find out we have that kind of uh, certification on it will, will order uh, that beef just because they're Muslim people. And um, but the rest of them buy it because it's the, the quality it is. And there's a new plant you know, that's been just been changing ownership uh, north of us that um, uh, maybe I can, excuse me a little bit west of us that is the Piedmont Custom Processors, and uh, they're doing an outstanding job of getting that plant, the old back end plant, uh, uh, cranked it up with some uh, new new equipment, and uh, um, it's going to be a great place to process your feed. So. Um, Processes, if you've got a process of plants, uh, uh, you be thankful. And if you don't, then uh, just look at uh, uh, the people who are doing it and they can tell you where the, plant, the closest plants are. Okay. Thank you for that, VMAC. Uh, we have a couple other questions, and um, we've got a few minutes left. I'm going to allow us to go over just a few minutes since uh, we got a little bit of a late start. And so the question from Nancy is, do you lease the majority of your land? If so, do you find it hard to find land or landowners? I'm sorry, do you find it harder to find land or landowners? Well, um, land is always uh, uh, out there. Uh, in the hands of people who are at some point in life, they're ready to, ready to sort of back down their operation. Just like I mentioned about Mr. R.C. Cossey. Um, Mr. R.C. was uh, in his late 80s, pushing 90 years old, and he couldn't be at the least part of his farm. Uh, we do lease quite a bit of land. Uh, we lease, uh, um, I started saying well over 2,000 acres, but one of the tracks is that we're going to lease, in fact, tomorrow we're supposed to sign the papers on the buy it, one of those tracks. Uh, and uh, so it, I, would, I would love to lease as, uh, land as, as my first option. That's the cheapest option, is cheaper than owning it. Now, fortunately, where we are up on the Virginia border, uh, we can cross over into Virginia, and uh, there's good grazing land in Virginia we, we take under lease. and. And uh, my county has been a primarily the back of county, and uh, a lot of those farms have gone out of the back of business, and so we're able to lease those tobacco farms and convert them into grass farms. And uh, out of quite a few farms, we just plain farms that we lease the land, put it in grass, and type, put a tight fence around it with a long lease. This works very really well for us. Okay, thank you. And then the last question here, uh, if you could discuss, not really a question, just um, if you could discuss retail marketing versus wholesale with your beef business. You need both. Um, retail marketing is uh, absolutely the, uh, uh, the best uh, uh, avenue to go because you, you, you haven't put any hands between you and the consumer. That's the whole purpose about direct marketing is to uh, get as close to the consumer as you can. There's nothing like a one-to-one -one transaction between you and the person who's going to be eating that product. Uh, we've done that in two different ways. We've done that uh, really three different ways. We, uh, we still go to the Carver Farmers Market. Uh, we've gotten to be called fair weather marketers now because it's going to rain or be cold or anything like that. They always don't show up. But uh, at any rate, uh, that led us to uh, building a store on our farm. We took a three-car garage and converted it into a beef store, and uh, it's uh, it's growing more and more every year with business, and we're constantly having to do some more expansion on it. Uh, and because we have that uh, um, store to work out of, we've gotten in direct marketing over the internet. The uh, our website is now has a shopping cart and. Uh, it's a good shopping cart. It's easy. Uh, you all are very user friendly. People uh, send out, send us orders in all week. We hold them till Monday and ship them on Monday with, uh, with UPS. And so we've learned to be able to ship across country. 
uh, put in dry ice and insulated shippers and uh, letting go. And, and so um, that's been a, a good addition to us in, 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 uh, in marketing. So, uh, and, 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 and uh, Whole Foods has been very, very good to us. Uh, if you go to Whole Foods, uh, 11 Whole Foods store we're in now, and, and all of those uh, uh, guys behind the meat counter have been out to the farm, and, and, and they, they know our story, and they will repeat it behind the counter if anyone asks. And in fact, they've got my picture, uh, I think, in all the stores uh, hanging on the wall. It's a few lines about the Bowen family farm. So that, you know, that always helps. And um, we've had many, many customers that get acquainted with IB first at Whole Foods and then come in and buy from us in, in, uh, in, in some quantity. They buy it by quarters and things like that. Okay. Thank you so much. And we have one additional question here. Um, can you disclose an estimate of annual sales? And that is a question um, up to you whether to answer that or not, certainly. That's, uh, that's kind of business confidential. We, uh, we, don't certainly. Like, we don't like to tout that very much. Um, but um, we're blessed and uh, um, we just uh, try, to, uh, try to keep up. Yeah, let me put it this way. Um, we're, we're without, without herd inventory. We've got about 1,500 head of cattle right now. And uh, we wish we had 2,000. So that's, that all tell you something about our beef sales. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, the demand is there. Is, uh, you make the product remarkable, and you'll sell all the beef you can possibly ever grow. Let's put it that way. Okay? Well, thank you. I'm looking at the time, and um, I think we've put in our 45 minutes here. VMAX, thank you so much for taking the time to come on this webinar today and share your story and share what you feel has made you successful in the uh, farming business that you are in. We really appreciate that. I uh, want to let folks know to save the date and go ahead and register for the Farmer Idea Lab number three coming up in April. We're calling this Farm Transitions. It's Cliff Pilsen with CV Pilsen Farms. It'll be moderated by Rebecca Dunning uh, of the CEFS North Carolina Growing Together Project. And I have pasted the link to register into the chat bar. Uh, I will also send you to a survey here in just a moment. If you can please fill that out, and that will also direct you to the registration page. Thank you all for being with us today. I do hope you'll fill out the survey and let us know how we can improve on these into the future uh, and if they're helpful to you. So I hope you all have a great day. Thank you very much.